Hello, everyone. Welcome to this week's episode of Catholic Recon Testimonies from Reverts and Converts. I'm your host, Eddie Trask. And this week's guest is a colleague of mine, Stacy Wentz. Stacy, I'm going to start off by saying thank you for um, just your working friendship and your willingness to talk about your faith journey. I really, really, it, it means a lot to me, and I appreciate you taking time um, out of your day to be here. Well, thank you for the opportunity. I just, uh, it's just kind of one of those things I can't not do, you know, when I have the opportunity, and um, it just felt like it was time. That's so. awesome. No, I really, really appreciate that. Um, as I start with pretty much every testimony, why don't you take us back to your childhood, the early beginnings? How did your uh, faith journey begin? Yeah, sure. Um, well, you know, to be honest, it didn't really have any religious upbringing um, as a child, though um, uh, by God's providence, we lived right, I lived in a little bitty town that was like four blocks big and right down the street from my house, um, my side of the tracks was one block big and the Methodist church was on our side of the church. And um, when I was 13, I just, I mean, like when I was a little kid, we'd go, sometimes go into the church because they never locked it. And um, I just remember being kind of intrigued and playing around with the piano and um, taking the sugar cubes, which, you know, I shouldn't have been doing. <laughs> And, but that was so unique. You know, we never got sugar cubes in my home. And um, of course, um, that was something that I was able to deal with when I became Catholic. <laughs> but uh, you were able to get sugar cubes. Yeah, that's. No, I was able to get forgiven. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I was going to say, I, th I thought you were able to get sugar cubes without having to uh, steal them. So. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. So. Um, when I was 13, though, I started to go to uh, to the church services and just on my own, you know, it was literally, I mean, and we're talking small town blocks and um, I would go to the church service and I was really attracted by a sense of love. You know, I could see the love in families with young children and um, there was must have been some kind of announcement about um, confirmation and I asked asked about that. And um, I was aware that, you know, other people that I went to school with were being confirmed and such. But what came to be discovered was that, well, I couldn't be confirmed in the Methodist church unless I was baptized. So I um, was baptized at 13 in the Methodist church. And it's the only time my dad ever went to church with me. And only one of two times that my mom ever, ever was in, in a church with me. So um, not a whole lot happened after that. Uh, I always had a tendency toward um, toward God and toward the spiritual. But, you know, in my teen years, I remember writing in my journal for my rhetoric class that I wasn't sure whether we had, um, it, God had created us or we had created God. So the typical, you know, those kind of things you need to sort out and, and the questions you need to ask. And um, I, again, by Providence, my parents happened to move away from that area where I had only, I had lived my entire life and I had only gone to one school, literally one school building from first grade. And I was now a senior in high school. I was 17. And they, because I was a senior, they agreed to let me stay there. So I lived with a family that I babysat for. And they went to a Presbyterian church. So I, everything's a little bit peppered all over here. Um, and the in the Presbyterian church, the one thing I remember is that every week we made an affirmation that said, I belong to the family of God. And that meant so much to me. And um, it just really, you know, it just really stuck with me and um, really made me feel loved. And um, this family had four small children. And again, I've always been attracted to uh, little kids and um, just the idea of a, a big family. And when 
I graduated, I was getting ready to graduate and um, my parents planned for me to come back to, to move up to where they were. And because I was still only 17, I thought I had to do what they wanted. And I was crushed, I didn't want to leave, but so glad now, you know, that I did. But at that time, it was it was heartbreaking. And I had planned that when I turn 18, I would I would go back home, you know, home was where I had lived for 17 years of my life, you know, my, my whole life. And I was all packed up and ready to go. And I just couldn't find the courage to tell my dad I was going. So I just unpacked my stuff and I stayed. And that led to, uh, you know, all the circumstances that led up to where I'm at right now, of course, you know, we, the the different paths we choose, we don't realize, you know, what, until we look back in retrospect that, wow, what would have happened if I had done that, you know, if I had went and moved back home and um, very, very grateful that I'm, I'm where I'm at now. So I, um, then, uh, uh, really didn't have much of an experience with, um, with God or church or anything until I had my first child. I, um, was, you know, in my young twenties and, um, we had a little girl and I wanted her to be baptized. And so, um, I went to a covenant church and, um, it just, like I said, I always had this something in me drawing me to him and, um, to Christ and, uh, had her baptized, but then when I was pregnant with my second child, I was attending a county fair. And at this fair, there was a booth there by this church. And they were, you could go in and you could get water. And I remember it was very hot and I was very thirsty. And so the water was very attractive. And there was also this little teddy bear that you could sign up to win that played Jesus Loves Me. So I wanted to win that for my daughter. And I didn't win the teddy bear, but I did fill out the slip to try to win it. And there was a little box so you could check that said, you know, that if you, whether or not you wanted somebody to speak to you more about the faith. And I checked it. And within a week, somebody came. So, well, they called me first. And when they came to the home, it turns out they were an independent, charismatic, you know, evangelical church. And they came to my home and for the first time ever, they introduced me, you know, I was introduced to the Holy Spirit and I had tried many times to read the scriptures and really just, you know, kind of hit a, hit a brick wall. And, but, you know, when I invited the Holy Spirit into my life, it just, the scriptures just literally just opened up. They just, all of a sudden I could understand what I was reading and it could speak to me, you know, it could speak to me, you know, God speaking to me and in, in his word. And it was very, very powerful. And so um I became very, very involved in the church, especially in the areas of children's ministry and um and such as as well as youth, nursery, all the way up from nursery up to working with you. I have to ask you, was that the first time you were consistently going? to church or were you going earlier yes. in life? Pretty much. Yeah. Other than, you know, when I, you know, for the short periods that I mentioned earlier. Yeah. 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 So I actually, um, through th three different churches, um, and, uh, spent 25 years as an evangelical, uh, charismatic, um, almost said Catholic. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I was just, Protestant. I was, I was yep. on fire for God, love the Lord. And, um, as I said, that, that happened when I was pregnant with my second child and, um, ended up having eight children and, um, you know, our whole lives kind of centered around our, our church experience and, um, and they've all, you know, were, were baptized and such, um, at, um, now that we were in a charismatic, uh, uh, independent church. It was, you know, more like when they expressed a desire. So they were all baptized. And then um, really great pastor. I had two really great pastors in that 25 year experience as a Protestant. And um, in between them were kind of sandwiched, uh, kind of a little bit of a, 
a bad experience. And it, during that time, it, what it was was a, a, a pastor from another church had taken on our independent church because that pastor was retiring. And so this is where I began to first question things because um, I saw some abuses with the way that the word of God was being handled. Um, and I also saw um, some other abuses financially and, and such like that. And I just started to kind of ask the question, like, you know, who's in charge here? It just, you know, it just, nobody can say anything. When, and so, when you say abuses with scripture, just like there was an agenda that was forced into scripture or? Well, that's a good question. The um, one particular example I can give you, mostly it would center around money. Okay. <laughs> So one particular example was one Sunday we were told that when God told Abraham that he was his shield and exceedingly great reward, that that meant in the original language that he was his never ending supply of money. <laughs> I was like, that was the biggest stretch you could possibly make, you know? Yeah. And, um, and because, um, we were involved in leadership there. I, you know, we were able to see that, that there were some financial abuses going on and, and uh, we made the decision to, to move on to an open Bible church where, um, where I was at at the time that I had my conversion to the Catholic faith. So at, um, you know, we gave notice, you know, we wanted to give notice because I had actually written a curriculum um, for the, the pastor, you know, that I'd had for a decade for the children and it was being used by a couple of churches and in the homeschool community and such. And when I wrote this curriculum, um, I wanted, you know, I felt like I, we, I was in charge at that time of everything from nursery on up through youth group. I didn't, um, somebody else was doing the youth group, but I was in, in charge of it. And I just felt that we needed to tell the kids we were leaving and we were told, no, don't come back, you know? So, um, so it was a hard time, you know, when, you know, when you leave a Protestant church like that, that in so, so, at least my experience was that um, you are automatically, you know, kind of ostracized, um, especially in these independent um, type atmospheres. Um, sometimes it's done in a loving way, but you know, you're kind of told, well, you know, we can't, we'll wait for you to come back home. Kind of like the same thing the church, Catholic church does, but Catholic church is home. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so it, you know, it was really hard because all of our friendships, you know, were from there, but then, you know, God really helped us to get really established and we felt very welcome the first time we walked into the open Bible church, but this experience I that we had in between Go ahead. I'm sorry. When you say open Bible, I'm sorry. I thought I knew what you meant by that, but I don't. What it what okay? It it's just mean? kind of a. It's not really a denomination. It's more of a. Um, it's like a group of independent churches. Who, kind of agree to be connected. I don't know exactly how to explain. I, it. I see what you're saying. Absolutely. Yeah. So it's a bunch of. I've seen this before. You're not even saying that you agree on all the whatever. Even they they probably would say they agree on what they deem to be the essentials. And so mm -hmm. they join this network of churches. Is that similar? I mean, that's what I've heard of. Yeah, there, but there was government, you know, oh. involved there. There was structure because okay. there was like regional and national offices. Um, but yeah, it's it's somewhat loose, but uh, you know, a little bit safer than completely independent. Got it. And, okay. And um, the the that made made me feel safe after after you know the abuses we've been through. Like you know, like I just remember just kind of weeping. You know, the first like like first four or five times that I was sitting in the services because I literally felt like these chains were falling off of me, um, and um, for the first time I started to really have an experience that um, my faith wasn't about what I believed. It was, it just rested in God and God alone, you know? And, um, but while we were there or while we were in the church with the, with the um, questionable experience, I had read a book that a friend gave me 
And it was written by a Protestant pastor named Tommy Tenney. And it was called The God Chasers. And um, years later, when I uh, became involved in Catholic environment, um, but before I had my conversion, I picked up the book and I looked back at it. And so if you don't mind, I'd like to just read a couple little phrases from it. Absolutely. Okay. So on the back cover, it says, what is a God chaser? A God chaser is an individual whose hunger exceeds his reach. A God chaser is a person whose passion for God, excuse me, whose passion for God's presence presses him to chase the impossible in hope that the uncatchable might catch him. So um, and then it, it makes reference here on the back of the cover too that, you know, Job was a God chaser. He said, oh, that I knew where I might find him. David, my soul followeth hard after thee and Paul, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. Well, when I pick this book up, I, I mark my books with highlighters and with pen and circles and squares and arrows. And, and I was able to look back at things I had marked in this book during that difficult time. This was now, um, you know, a, about a decade later. And I ran across some really interesting phrases. Um, for instance, one of the chapters is called, All everything I had marked had to do with God's presence and bread. Wow. <laughs> and um, one of the titles of the chapters is, let's see here, No Bread in the House of Bread, Crumbs in the Carpet and Empty Shelves. And, you know, I was starting to have this, this hunger, like there's just something missing. There, there's got to be something more. And um, I had a friend tell me that, you know, that there was just so much more. You know, that that in the Catholic faith, everything just connects from the beginning to end. And there's just so much more. But, you know, as a Protestant, you know, we're, you know, I was a very sincere and I was surrounded by very sincere people who were seeking truth. And who the problem with finding the fullness of truth, though, was that we thought we already had it, you know, so um, nobody else could have it because we had it. <laughs> so um uh some of the other things that were interesting that I marked are that it says he's tired of being second to the church program and the church life. Everything good should flow from the presence of God. And um there's there's quite a bit more, but here's here's another one about hunger that says he looks for the hungry. Hunger means you're dissatisfied with the way it's been because it's forced you to live without him in his fullness. Oh. So as I began, as I look back at that, I realized, wow, you know, way back then he was calling me into the fullness of the faith. And um, I just was, was, I, I've kept the book. It's the only Protestant book I've kept. What? Um, but because I refer to those phrases. That is amazing. What um, denomination is he affiliated with, if you know? Um, I just know that he's a third generation minister. Um, okay. And I believe it is. Um, yeah, I'm checking to see here, but I, I'm not seeing necessarily. He actually founded a, a group called GodChasers.net. Yeah, but, it's so funny. Um, I've not heard of that until today. So <clears throat> as you pick that up in your, you mentioned the friend that was talking about the fullness. Did, was there a moment where you just said, oh my gosh, this is what I'm looking for? Or was it this gradual process that I hear about on a regular basis. Oh, yes. Very, very gradual. Um, what happened is at that time that I picked this book back up and looked at it, I had started working for Lighthouse Catholic Media. So here I am. I'm a Protestant. I'm working for a Catholic company. <laughs> um, I My kids were enrolled in a um, Baptist school because um, I had homeschooled for 18 years but um, 
the winds of life kind of changed and um, I had to enter the workforce. So, um, so I had them in this Baptist school and I was going to a charismatic evangelical church, you know, so, <laughs> so in the I, Catholic world, in the Baptist world, in the charismatic world. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I got hired by Lighthouse Catholic Media again at the um, at the um, reference of this this friend, the same friend. And uh, as I began working there, of course, you know, it's a is a content apostolate, you know. So, um, you know, Mark Midner, the president, and he's handing me all these CDs and um, I've been addicted ever since to content. And I can remember the moment he handed me my first CD and it was on um, the family and then things like anger and forgiveness, things, things that were not necessarily had to do with, with um, you know, what the Catholic faith believed, but that could kind of be applied. You know, they were Catholic, but, but he didn't go for the hardcore stuff until, um, until a few months in. And in the fall of, um, you know, I want to say, first of all, that, you know, the gift that um, my two very good Protestant pastors gave me was a deep love of scripture and um, faithful teaching, um, you know, in in what they knew and understood as truth, faithfully handing that down and teaching, you know, passing on that love of scripture. And one of the things I got from both of them was to understand the connectedness between the Old and the New Testament, because we did get a lot of Old Testament teaching. And um, to understand the connection. So it's the fall of 2008, I think, shortly after I'd started. And I'm listening to The Fourth Cup by Scott Hahn. And I'm driving. I had a 50-minute commute, which was uh, 50 minutes an hour, which was very conducive to this, this place that God had put me in. So I'm listening to the CD. And it wasn't the first time I'd listened to it. But as I'm listening... I realized that um, he's talking about um, the 10th plague and about, you know, the death of the firstborn and that we needed to consider, um, you know, how God had given them very implicit instructions, the, the Hebrew people, in order to be spared from this plague, you know, and that they, that they were to, you know, to um, sacrifice a young lamb and that they were to sprinkle its blood on the doorposts and the lintels of their homes. And that then they were to eat the lamb. And Dr. Hans said, what if you had done some of what the Lord had instructed? What if you had, you know, sacrificed the lamb and you had sprinkled its blood on the doorposts in lintels of your home, but what if you fail to eat the lamb? And it just really, I mean, it hit me so much that I just literally stopped it and I replayed the track and listened to it again. And then I shut it off because I knew exactly what it was saying, you know, because I understood that Jesus was the lamb of God. Um, and not in, you know, not in the Catholic sense um, as I know him now, but that he was that lamb and that that, he, that represented Christ and um, that um, it was that they were spared from the angel of death because of the blood of the lamb. So I mean, I understood that fully when Dr. Han, Han was saying that. And it's interesting that, you know, my love of scripture is where God met me. You know, he met me right where I was at and um, just lots of little things along the way that, you know, little ways he loves us that, you know, that we, we don't want to overlook or ever forget. So um, that fall, we had a conference um, for Lighthouse and um, well, we had one every year. And our guest speakers that year were Patrick Madrid and Father Francis Peffley. And I'm at this conference and I'm just going through this, you know, interiorly, I'm having pretty intense conversations with Mark Middendorf and Tim Truckenbrode, who was our vice president. And they were intense questions, a lot of questions, a lot of conversation, you know, led by questions, you know, and they would always end with a question mark, which was just a really awesome way to evangelize, you know, um, because it left you thinking, hmm, you know, <laughs> and it really taught me too that, 
you don't have to always bring every conversation to a conclusion. You can just kind of, you know, just plant seeds and, um, and, uh, they were good conversations. So anyway, we're at do you remember topic. some of those? Do you remember some of those? Questions? Oh yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And, um, and I, I, but it was at this conference that Patrick Madrid goes up. Well, first, uh, I, I can't remember what order, but Fa Francis Pathley taught on, um, uh, an invitation to the Catholic faith. And of course we were recording these because they're going to become talks in the lighthouse program too. So an invitation to the Catholic faith. And then uh, Patrick Madrid's talk is now called why Catholic. But at the time we had called it why I am Catholic when I could be anything else. And as soon as he got up there and announced the title, talk, title of his talk, I looked at Mark and I said, you did this on purpose, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> And, uh, and he said, yes, I did. <laughs> so, so I'm listening to Pat Madrid and it was just really, really awesome. He, he begins to talk about how, you know, cause I had been researching a lot. Um, and I, but I would go home and I always make sure I had a Protestant source, you know, so I was guarding well, you know, what I was, what I was taking in and, um, Pat Madrid shared about how, you know, that um, in the Catholic church, you know, you have these beautiful stained glass windows and that they, you know, from the outside, when you look at uh, true stained glass windows, they look rather dull and uninteresting. And, um, you know, they don't really move you in any way, but that once you go inside and the light is streaming in, then you begin to see, then you see the beauty and it becomes alive and that, uh, that there's a message, you know, that's being revealed in the light. And through what he shared, I began to realize, wow, you know, if I'm going to give the Catholic faith um, a, a fair shake, then I need to be looking at the Catholic faith not from the outside in like I was doing, but from the inside out, uh, you know, looking at it from the inside, who better to help me to learn the Catholic faith than the Catholics? <laughs> um, because as we all know, you know, there's so much to the faith that is misunderstood and, um, and misconstrued by those who just don't know, you know, I was never anti-Catholic, but, um, you know, as I started to get my toes wet, I was somewhat critical, like, you know, well, this just doesn't make sense. You know, why do they worship Mary? And what's this Pope thing and all that, you know, all this stuff and the saints and, and such like everybody else goes through the same types of questions that, that most people have when they're um, not part of the Catholic faith. And so I began to just really, really, and I had been listening to Catholic content and I was preferring Catholic content, to be honest, <laughs> by this point already, but I just totally immersed myself. I don't think I've ever listened to a Protestant talk since, you know, I was into like Joyce Meyer and I um, can't think of her, oh, Beth Moore, you know, oh, yeah. different ones, you know, and um, and I, never, I don't think I've ever listened to another um, non-Catholic talk since that moment at that conference. So this is pretty early on in the time that I'm working at Lighthouse. And um, so I began to just really eat it up. At first I had, you know, kind of backed away um, after my conviction on um, on the uh, Lamb's Supper um, and the Passover. So I then, um, we had built a chapel at that time at Lighthouse as well. And the chapel was, you know, uh, we had gotten permission from the bishop to bring Jesus and have the Blessed Sacrament on reserve. And we, um, in order to do that, you had to have mass at least once a month. And I had already been like praying the chaplet of divine mercy with everyone, um, uh, the rosary sometimes. And then um, now we were able to have mass. So anyone could go to these masses. So I would go to these masses. And during the day, Jesus was sitting like 10 feet, the, the door to the chapel was like 10 feet from my desk, you know? So here, 
Jesus and his, it, it, uh, the bread that I'm hungering for is just 10 feet away from me. And uh, we're, we then hired somebody who was an acolyte. Um, and now we were able to have adoration. So I remember sitting there thinking, well, how come everybody's, so we had like, like people would go in for like 10 minute slots and I'm like, well, why are they, what are they doing in there? And why is nobody asked, you know, why, why is this like a secret that I don't know about? You know, I remember when we were building the chapel, I remember Mark showing me the monstrance. We got that beautiful altar um, that they believe that potentially Archbishop Fulton Sheen may have offered mass on that because it came from a uh, it had been stored. It had come from a convent in the uh, Peoria diocese. And um, this monstrance, you know, I'm just like, why do they have such weird names for things? You know, like, what's a monstrance? You know? <laughs> and, um, and so one day Mark said to me, he said, hey, I can't go in for my adoration slot, you know, and Jesus can't be left alone. So will you go in for me? And he probably did that on purpose too. And so I went in and I didn't stop going in. And this is really where the battle was was fought, was in this adoration chapel. So as I'm in there, I just prayed the same prayer every day, you know, because um, I knew in my head that what the scriptures were telling me was that Jesus was present in the Eucharist. I understood that from the scriptures now, and especially from, you know, also like John chapter six, but I didn't have, you know, faith to comprehend it, you know, and um, I had a lot to unlearn, you know, that's, I think that yeah. Protestants just have a lot to unlearn and, and I would go into adoration and, and I would always pray the same prayer. Um, I'd always recite a portion of a Psalm. Um, and then I would, um, pray a prayer and that prayer was always, you know, I just want to know the truth. Lord, show me the truth. And so here's Jesus exposed on the altar <laughs> and I'm saying, Lord, show me the truth. I'm talking to him. I'm calling him Lord and I'm asking him to show me the truth. And he's staring me in the face. And this goes on for nine months, um, until, uh, the next big change. And, um, I would get. Um, I would have some real wrestling matches in that chapel. You know, I, I look back and I, I call it my Jacob experience because I was wrestling with God. I was really wrestling with God. And I knew, I knew that um, just like Jacob's hip was placed out of joint and God changed his name. You know, I knew I wasn't going to come out the same on the other side of this. <laughs> and, um, and I wasn't going to, um, to let go until he blessed me until he showed me the truth, you know? And um, we had um, a mass then, now we're in 2010, okay? Cause we've gone nine month cycles a couple of times and 2010 in July 22nd. And I went to this mass and it wasn't the first one I'd gone to. I'd gone to, I think I'd gone to all of them, you know, um, unless I wasn't there or something. And it's the Feast of St. Mary Magdalene. Um, so the readings were um, based on the resurrection story. And um, I was, you know, just, um, you know, they, they, we, the mass began and, you know, we had the, the first reading and the Psalm. And then um, the priest got up and he read the gospel. And as he's reading the gospel, He's um, he's reading a couple things here because I I, I want to be sure that God gets proper glory here because <laughs> there's so much going on than just the details, you know. He says um, so Mary's looking for Jesus at the tomb, you know, because um, he's been laid in the tomb and it's the next morning and she's looking for him and she's weeping outside the tomb, Saint Mary Magdalene, and it says. Um, that, um, that she sees the two angels and they're like, why are you weeping? And she says, they've taken my Lord and I don't know where to find him. And that was me. It's just like, I, I don't know where to find you, Jesus. You know, where did you go? I thought I knew you, you know, where, where, where are you? 
And um, then she sees Jesus and she thinks he's the gardener. And um, uh, he says to her, um, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? I mean, he's talking straight to me, you know, but says supposing him to be the gardener she says to him sir if you've carried him away tell me where you've laid him and i will take him so jesus said to her mary he says mary like mary it's me you know and when i heard the priest say mary i literally heard my name spoken at the same time and um, I literally heard both Mary and Stacy at the same time. And it was so real. <laughs> it was so real that I looked around the room, you know, to see if anybody else heard it. And I didn't hear anything else in the mass after that <laughs> because I just was so, I mean, he just stopped me in my tracks. Like, Stacy, don't you recognize me? You know, I'm right here. And, you know, I think that the, you know, just like Mary, you know, I, I knew Jesus, this was Jesus to me, you know, and he fit in this box. And um, I couldn't see him outside of that form. And that I had been formed in for 25 years, you know, and even though I'd been speaking to him and calling him Lord for nine months, but I, I didn't recognize him. And that when he spoke her name, then she recognized him and the same thing happened to me. And that's when it went from here to here, you know? And um, it's just, you know, she runs and she tells the apostles and she says, I've seen the Lord, <laughs> you know? And that was, you know, that was my, um, that was my moment of, um, you know, the, final nail going into my conversion, but I wasn't quite home. <laughs> um, I did sign up for RCIA right away. And um, I struggled all the way through. Um, I would ask questions, but mostly I would just take a lot in. And I, to be honest, I wasn't as committed as I should have been. And I look back and I regret that, you know, like I was on a softball team in the Protestant church. And, and I had to go to my softball games, when, <laughs> even if they conflicted with RCIA, but it got down to the last week in RCIA. And um, Mark and Tim both picked up on the fact that I was hesitating. I never said a word to them, but they both picked up on it. And Tim said something to me on that um, Tuesday it was because I think we met on Tuesdays, it might've been Wednesday, but on that day, and then on my way home, Mark talked to me on my whole way home, I spoke with him. And um, it just, you know, it became very evident in the conversation that he understood I was struggling and, you know, that I was hesitating. And um, he finally, um, I remember the exact spot I was at, Zach Road, I was on Zach's spot before how far away from the stop sign when he said, you know, you need to talk to your pastor. Just talk to your pastor, do whatever he tells you to do. And so um, he says, because this is just a matter of obedience now, you know, and um, I went to RCIA and <laughs> the pastor, he's still my pastor. Um, this is 12, almost 13 years ago. And uh, what well, was 13 years? Well, 12, 12 and a half years ago. He says, uh, he starts out the lesson with these words. No kidding. He's like, um, he starts talking about the holiness of Jesus's name. And he starts talking about the, how important names are. And um, that he says, so when Jesus revealed himself to Mary Magdalene at the tomb, <laughs> how did he reveal himself to her? And, you know, when we were in the chapel that day, when I experienced that, I forgot to tell you that the priest, when he started his homily, the first thing he said was, what word in today's gospel leaped out at you? And I was just like, oh, somebody else answered this question, you know, <laughs> and 
somebody said rabbi and he's like no no not rabbi and um i said mary and he says yes mary and that was that was the last thing i remember from that mass was he said yes mary and it's so funny this yes this obedience mary um but he's talking mary magdalene and so um, when he asked that question, the same thing happened in RCIA. I was like, somebody else answer this question, please. <laughs> please <laughs> jump in. My goodness. Yeah. You know, and, you know, I'm sitting here think, planning and telling Father, I don't think I'm going to come in right now. And um, uh, nobody answered it. So I finally just said, he called her by name, you know, and he says, yes, he called her by name. So we go up, it's snack time, halfway through halftime. And I go up to him and I said, you know, Father, I'm, I just don't think I'm going to come in at this time. I, you know, I'm, I'm glad I went through the class. I, I can, you know, um, I'm already prepared in that way then when I, when I'm ready to come in, but I just don't think I can, you know, my, my struggles were, were just very real to me. You know, it was, it wasn't as much of what I didn't believe or understand about the Catholic faith as I had so much to leave behind, you know, 25 years in a tradition where, you know, our whole family, all of our relationships were based around, you know, the people that we were in fellowship with and all the ministry that we were doing and um, my softball team, <laughs> you know, just, um, things that now it's just like, you know, oh, Stacy, you yeah. know, but, but, um, but those were important, you know, and, and they were, you know, things that were right, you know, in addition to the scripture being such a strong force in my life. Um, and notice that in that mass, it was a scripture again, that God used to get me, but he did it in yep. the context of the mass. So we got the road of, to Emmaus, you know, in Stacy's conversion story, because, you know, it's scripture and Eucharist, you know, so both, both liturgies and it was, you know, um, he, he, but father looked at me when I told him, I didn't think I was coming in and he just said, just do what Mary did. Just say yes. But of course he was talking about the blessed mother and that's literally all he said. And so I left with my sponsor, um, another really good Catholic friend that I'd known for for about a whole decade, um, no, for about two decades, or I'm not sure, but I'd known her for a long time through the homeschool community. She was my sponsor and she lived on the way home, my way home. And I was driving that night. She would not get out of my car, <laughs> go in her house. <laughs> and, you know, we just, she just, you know, was listening, you know, and um, she says, you know, I think Mary would be a really good confirmation name for you. <laughs> And actually, um, my confirmation saint is St. Mary Magdalene. And um, I went home still, you know, unresolved. And I got out a journal, which I hadn't journaled in many years. And I was journaling and I wrote about what had happened throughout the day about Mark and Tim picking up on my hesitation and um, about um, what happened at our CIA. And um, all of a sudden, as I'm journaling, I remembered that my name, Stacy, means of the resurrection. It means of the springtime of the resurrection. Oh, my goodness. And it just hit me like he wrote my name into that story, you know. And I mean, it's everyone's story. You know, it belongs to everyone. He calls us all by name, but that he literally called me by name he put me in that resurrection story and that that was it i i said yes then um that i i that was when i made my decision okay i'm coming in now this is literally just days before the easter <laughs> oh my what year oh 11 wait i'm losing came track. in at 11 yeah 11, okay. i came in at 11 i started rca in 2010 okay yep so i came in in 11 2011 and, um, you know, that the things I, I, I think that also, you know, that when, when you're entering into the, the fullness of the faith, it's, you know, um, 
it's like everything just seemed so large. Like I could talk about the Catholic faith like crazy. I remember my sponsor saying, you could be teaching this class. And I thought, but see, I didn't have, you know, I, I, you know, there was a lot to be done in here, you know? So, you know, I had a lot of head knowledge because I knew a lot of scripture <laughs> is, is the thing. And I'm listening to all these Catholic teachings and I'm, um, and I, you know, I'm meeting all these Catholic speakers, you know, um, you know, I've met all those people that we've had at our conferences and listened to them in person. And um, your mind begins to be, you know, transformed by that, that renewal. I was blessed to have two really big conversions in my life. And um, the, the, uh, oh, I kind of lost my train of thought. I apologize. No, that's um, fine. Oh, I, I know what I was going to say. So it, it felt like, you know, like when you're, when you're outside the church and you're coming in, you feel like you got this big gulf you have to cross. And I think that I was looking at that final step, that final yes is like, oh, I've got this big leap to make. And then, but once I said yes, it was just one step. I just had to get out of the boat. You know, it's like, you know, I crossed the Tiber and now I just have to get out of the boat. That's it. You know, I'm here. I'm on the other shore. I'm here. He brought me home. And um, one, as soon as that happened, a lot of the questions that I had, because one of the things I had to say to myself was like, okay, I don't get this Mary thing, Mary, the mother of Jesus. I did not in the mother of God. And I didn't get that yet, but as soon as I was confirmed, it was literally like God took me and put me in her arms. And it's like, you know, you look into the face of your mother and you don't have any, nobody has to tell you this is your mother, you know, she's nurtured you to bring you to life, you know, already. And you know, her voice and you know her and, um, I never had another doubt about anything, you know, if there were teachings I didn't understand, all of a sudden I understood them and it was just, you know, it was just the gift of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Oh it was gosh. just the gift of the Holy Spirit. I didn't have to figure it out intellectually, which was a huge stumbling block for me always has been. And it's something I have to be careful of even now that, you know, that, um, you know, I couldn't get to faith because I was so busy trying to figure it all out. <laughs> and um, I was begging him, though, for that gift. And he gave it to me, you know, so I've been so blessed. And, you know, of course, you know, I look back and I realize, oh, I wasn't chasing him. He was chasing me. <laughs> you realize all these things I couldn't have written into it. You know, I couldn't have made any of that stuff up. And even the fact that from the time that that mass happened on July 22nd, 2010, until the time I came into the Catholic church was like four days short of nine months. It was like, literally like she carried me in her womb, you oh, know, wow. that day. Beautiful. And uh, yeah, it, it was just, you know, it's just so tremendous and su such a beautiful thing that I, I'm so very, very grateful. And I'm grateful for everything that my Protestant experience brought to me that I've mentioned, you know, of the good. It, it led to my conversion in the end. God used it. And it was very, 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 very powerful to see how how the, the, the depths and the extents he'll go to to, yeah, <laughs> to reach I'm just one soul. I really appreciate you mentioning that and other people have as well the the importance of the of their Protestant journey. You speak to scripture and how the pastors were trying their best and the love of scripture and learning scripture so that when you end up in RCIA you're hearing a lot of the same scriptures placed in the proper context placed among the typology that you were mentioning earlier. And it, as you said, I think at the beginning, everything starts to click. But without that experience, I mean, you have to talk about that experience that God is using and used all of that for good. And I think it's fantastic. Now, <clears throat> I wanted to ask you about 
Well, maybe you were going to cover it. What it was like to enter the church and receive the sacraments and the life, the 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 graces that are given to you. Well, I learned pretty early on that um, I no longer got up to go to work in the morning. I got up to go receive Jesus. <laughs> and um, I still try to go to daily mass um, and unless something in my work schedule requires me to, you know, to, to begin earlier in the day. Um, I, um, I have I to say, you, you, much... you said you couldn't meet with me. You could not be interviewed because you were going to go early in the morning to daily mass. And I said, <laughs> Hey, I get it. I get it. You, you definitely need to go to daily mass as opposed to, uh, being interviewed so. yeah, I think that time I spent in that in the chapel in adoration is is really where you know um I fell in love with him and not realizing it you know and how much he wanted to show me you know I am the truth <laughs> I am the way the truth and the life and um I think you know as far as the sacrament of reconciliation goes my first confession you know um very long, you know, of course, because, you know, an adult coming into the church, but so cleansing. And um, I was reflecting recently uh, to my pastor that, you know, that God has done his greatest work of sanctification in my soul in that box, that little bitty box through confession, you know, and through the, the um, direction and instruction from the priest and the mercy you know, and how much I, right away I began to benefit from, you know, the graces that not just the sacramental grace, but the, the actual graces to overcome, you know, temptations that I had dealt with my whole life and just absolute freedom. And then um, just the little, you know, I can go into the confessional for just, you know, I'm probably not even in there two minutes. And I go like once a month, sometimes more often, you know, but, but once a month is my regular. And in that little bit of time, there's so much that he offers us that, you know, that um, it doesn't have to be that, you know, we're in a, a state of mortal sin yeah. for us to, to receive just the most abundant riches of grace and mercy in the sacraments. And I love the sacraments so much that I've been involved in RCIA now for seven years and um, I taught it for three years. And then um, with COVID, father, our school closed. And so father's like, I miss teaching. I need it back. You know, so he did it the next two years with me subbing and um, the deacon subbing sometimes. And then last year we split it because he had a sabbatical. So we just kind of half and half, you know, um, we got the people acclimated to the fact that it's going to be both of us. And then he was gone for eight weeks or 10 weeks, something like that. And he went to the Holy land. And, um, and then this year, again, I'm just supporting him and, and um, backing him up. How many opportunities do you have? I don't know that I've asked this question. So you're teaching RCIA. Uh, how many opportunities do you have to kind of counsel some of those candidates? Um, if they have similar barriers that are up, or, you know, they might have that intellectual emphasis and they they can't get to the faith element I, did, does that come up on a regular basis absolutely um uh, uh, th i could think off the top of my head three of those things that i shared with you that i went through that i have shared with individuals the just one more step yeah. you know the hesitation right at the end you know you know it feels so big but it's just one more step and then um the same with uh um with just saying yes, or um, the, um, it's, you know, that you don't have to have it all figured out that, you know, that the, um, when you receive, you know, the grace and the gift of the Holy Spirit, you know, he's going to be your helper. It's, you know, you're, it's, it's a lifelong journey. You know, you're going to be going through constant conversion and constantly, constantly learning. I learned something new about the faith every day and I'm still searching for it every day so for now I know who he is oh, and, you know it's just uh so beautiful you know um 
I just can't think of any other word for it. But yes, I definitely get to to do that with people, especially the women, you know, um, it seems like each year there's certain ones that will uh, cling, you know, I just kind of connect with and um, we develop a relationship um, that of that nature that endures, um, not, not necessarily becoming, you know, buddy, buddy, sure. friend, friend, you know, best friends, but that they continually come back and um, I'll continually pick up the phone and, you know, say, hey, I haven't seen you, you know, and um, what can I do to help? And then we have those conversations again. Amazing. Um, I'm wondering if you can uh, maybe think of a few times since since being received into the church, maybe some pretty um, incredible experiences. You mentioned these experiences leading up to RCIA, just super dramatic. And then I was just wondering if, if there are any things in the past decade that, that stand out. There are. Um, I've never shared them outside of spiritual direction. Um, you don't, you do not have to. That is for sure. I... Um, really, um, especially in regard to um uh, some of the saints and, and the blessed mother, um, and Jesus. Um, but, um, they were, uh, I just, I don't think God has given me permission yet. You know, if he may ever understood, um, you know, they're, um, cause they certainly wouldn't want it to draw any attention, you know, to myself. And there, there was a time where I knew someone was in great need of consolation. And so, I asked the Lord um, to stop, to give my consolations. And these are a little bit uh, different than just, you know, consolations. They um, have very deep messages in them, but I asked him to give them to a particular priest and they stopped. They stopped. And um, I hope he got them <laughs> because they stopped. <laughs> and, uh, I mean, the Lord still, you know, speaks to me all the time just because, you know, the word is in me and the word is alive. And, um, you know, uh, especially, you know, he'll speak to me concerning, you know, things to say to people or things not yeah. to say to people, you know, things yeah. like that, you know, just yeah. the normal daily walk stuff. Yep. It's not yeah. like God has gone silent in my life. I, you know, I have suffered through a couple times where I felt, um, um, that I could only receive his be, he could only be present to me by faith, only be present to me by faith because I didn't experience it in any way, sure. you know, but, but, um, yeah, that's. No, I, I appreciate that, Stacey. I, I think that, um, suffice it to say that all of those experiences, whatever they are, to me, it just shows there's a there's a witness that that I notice in you that's just beautiful and so all of that there's there's something um yeah well, it's crazy. The, the holy spirit is is um definitely present in you and so I appreciate you uh kind of hesitating there and saying like if it's not to be shared totally cool yeah the holy spirit like I told you I discovered the holy spirit when they came to me in my home you know, the, that Protestant church. Yeah. Um, so that was in 1988. And then, you know, there were a couple um, things during my Protestant time where I really grew closer to the Holy Spirit too. Um, one was uh, through um, a series done by a preacher. I think he ended up I'm not sure. So I don't want to say that, say that I put my hand over my mouth again. But it was a, <laughs> He was a preacher called Larry Lee, and he taught a series called um, uh, Could You Not Tarry One Hour? And um, in conjunction with a book that had been written by Benny Hinn called uh, Good Morning, Holy Spirit. Okay, I've heard of that. Yep. Yeah. And so the, those two of those kind of came into my life at the same time. And um, the the Could You Not Tarry One Hour, of course, was a way of you know devoting an hour 
working very, very slowly through the Lord's Prayer. And that was probably my only experience with the Lord's Prayer in my Protestant experience because we just didn't pray it, you know. And, you know, you think of all the times you pray it now. So when I came into the whole, excuse me, into the Catholic Church, I was, um, I was sitting back and observing for quite a while after I came in because I kept kind of saying, not in a doubting way, but just kind of, Lord, where is the Holy Spirit in the Catholic Church? And then I went to a retreat and, um, and I remember asking a question in RCIA too about, you know, the whole charismatic experience or everything. And I just kind of left all that behind, not, you know, completely like I, you know, give validation to the fact that the Holy Spirit was working in me, you know, all those years. Um, he was alive and active in me, but, um, but the, the, uh, just where is the Holy Spirit in the church? And when I went to this retreat that we hosted in our parish, um, and I actually was asked to give a talk at the retreat, but it's just like, we renewed our sacraments. And when we did, it's like, whew, it's like all of a sudden I realized, oh my goodness, the Holy Spirit is everywhere <laughs> in the Catholic church. You know, it's, he's just got a stamp on everything. You know, he, it's him who acts in the sacraments, you know, and, and um, just, you know, I mean, Christ acting, you know, through him and, and, you know, his, his gifts and, and um, just, just tremendous, you know, just, and the gifts, you know, of the Holy Spirit. And, you know, there's the confusion between you get the gifts and the fruits. And then why are the gifts different than the gifts that we learned in the Protestant church? <laughs> it's like, and then it just, all these years, it just still, you know, have to sit before the Lord and just, um, cause I still like to sit in his presence and just sit there and ask him to teach me, you know, you know, teach me more about what it means to be poor in spirit or teach me, you know, more about what it means to, um, to, uh, you know, to be pious or um, to walk in the fear of the Lord, you know, because it's just, it's just this beautiful, unending, never ending, you know, there's, there's so much more, like my friend had told me, you know, and she was right. And, and to see that it is truly all connected from Genesis to Revelation, you know, and to understand that by the scriptures and by the teachings of the church and what a gift the church is, you know, and teaching our CIA that just really gets magnified too, you know, um, because the church is such a gift and it's such a, it's such a safe place compared to that uncertainty that I had experienced, you know, where, you know, every church is just kind of its own Lone Ranger thing and um, just happy to be home and a part of the whole, you know? Beautiful. Beautiful. Do you like, you know how you mentioned your friend that helped you? Have you had an opportunity to be similar to that friend in other words are you do you have friends sometimes I, I i get different answers do you have friends that are still in the charismatic circles for example or is it more of a catholic i don't know catholic no, community I do, a, I do have a few friends um from the um my former community um one of them, I just got an invitation to go to something for her husband's 70th birthday party. Um, and she was a worship leader at our church and we were really good friends. And um, it's probably been over a year since we got together, but um, yes, you know, um, and, and the one thing I learned um, in sharing with my very closest friends when uh, shortly after I had come into the church is that they both said to me, you know, I'm really happy for you. And um, I want to know more, you know, but one of them has since passed. And, um, and the other um, is, you know, just, I'm not really sure where she is in her, her, in her faith life right now. But, but, you know, I think that, you know, it was hard to think about, you know, how am I going to explain this to my Protestant friends? But in the end, it didn't become 
an explanation that I had to give. Mm -hmm. It was just like I'm doing now, just sharing. This is what's happened to me. And this is, this is what God has done in my life. And then for them, when you have a, you have spiritual friendships, they cross that border between Protestant and Catholic when one crosses over because they, you have spiritual integrity between you in that relationship. And they recognize you are a person of spiritual integrity. And if they are true friends, they, they know that they know that this is what our whole relationship is based on. You know, we're friends because we're Christian and that's what is the core of our friendship. And that doesn't change, you know, when one becomes Catholic. It certainly shouldn't. <laughs> so, so well said. I think that's so good. It's a really good reminder that they're beautiful, faithful friends. Yeah. I'll just leave it there that you're absolutely right. That you, you've built it on a strong foundation. And what I love is the freedom that you have, that you're expressing to share what happened. I can't, I can't not share. You can't not. I, I've spoken to people. I've been that person where there's, it's sad, but it's true that there's a reluctance sometimes, which frustrates me because I know what he did. And sometimes I'm more concerned about where someone else is in their faith journey that I hesitate when in fact it should just be this free thing. Like I'm not, it's not, you're not imposing. What you're doing is you're sharing what God did in your life. So I really appreciate you sharing that. Yeah, yeah absolutely. You'd share with them something great you watched on Formed. So you yeah. share. <laughs> that's right. You know, you, we, we share, you know, the things that we get excited about in life. Yeah. Good, you know, good movie or. Yeah. Uh, so good. why not the faith, you know? Why not the faith? Um, Stacy, is there oh. anything else you want to add uh, before we close it? I just, you know, want to thank you again for the opportunity. And uh, I just, um, I just pray that um, it resonates with someone who may listen, even if only one person listens, you know, that, that it, something that I've said would resonate in their lives because um, there's such a glorious, glorious um, grace in becoming Catholic. Amen. And uh, Amen. Thanks again, Stacy. Really appreciate it. Uh, everyone, please comment and share and subscribe and may God be with all of you. Amen. <laughs>